Okay, so we're going to finish up renewable energy today. So hydropower, this is a pretty big one. Um, a lot of the, as far as renewable energy goes, we get a pretty good percentage from hydropower. And this is usually in the form of dams of one kind or another. And this is Hoover Dam, which is the biggest one in North America. So basically with hydropower, hydroelectric power plants, a dam is built across a large river to create a reservoir. The higher the head or the amount of, the higher the water is on one side than the other, the greater the amount of power that can be generated. Water is stored in the reservoir during low electricity production. Water's release and flows are controlled as electrical demands peak. As the water flows through, it spins the turbines in the powerhouse and electricity is distributed to the end users. So just like the steam plants, the fossil fuel plants, everything we've looked at, electricity is being produced by turning a turbine. And in this case, it's the flow of water. So there's advantages and disadvantages. Advantages, you have a moderate to high energy yield. Low operating maintenance cost. Doesn't cost much once it's done. Low air pollution. Once it's made, there's basically no air pollution. And the power plants last longer, two to ten times longer life than other power sources. Disadvantages. When you put in a dam, you make a reservoir, and those reservoirs flood a lot of area. So you create floods behind the dam, destroys habitats. You make new habitats. You have open water habitats now that you didn't have before, but you've destroyed the rivers. You've destroyed the whatever was on the sides of the rivers. And nowadays, if you want to make a dam, almost always somebody already lives there. So you uproot a lot of people. Um, pesticides, algicides are often used to keep things from growing in the water behind the dam. Affects the fish a lot. In some areas where fish migrate, it's very difficult for them to migrate around a dam. Um, and dissolved oxygen problems. It changes a lot of things about the flow of the water. Um, I've been to it, been canoeing around a dam before, and fish were going through the dam. They'd get sucked in low in the water and come up high on the other side. Um, basically, when you get that high pressure water being all of a sudden took to the surface, it releases a lot of oxygen because more oxygen can be dissolved in deep water than in shallow water. And if the fish come out, they actually can get basically like the bends. Um, so there's a lot of issues with that. At this particular place we were canoeing, um, you could see the fish floating up to the surface on the other side, and a lot of birds were coming in and eating them. So the birds liked it. But anyway, it uh, basically really modifies the habitats of what was there before. With hydroelectric plants, also, as the fish go through the plant, they get chopped up by the turbines, so that can cause a lot of problems. Okay, this is the Aswan High Dam. I've showed you Hoover Dam already. The Three Gorges Dam. This is a relatively new dam, and it was in the news quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of controversy about it. It's the largest hydroelectric dam in the world. It's on the Yangtze, or the Yellow River, in China. It's the world's largest power station of any kind. At one, its record production was 101.6 terawatt hours. That's a lot of energy. 20 times the production of Hoover Dam. In addition to electricity, it provides downstream flood control. But there are problems with it. And from this picture, if it's going to work, you can see how much wider the river is here. This area was just narrow streams, and now they're big lakes. 1.3 million people had to move. Their villages were basically flooded. 244 square miles of land was flooded. That's a lot of habitat alteration. Many archaeological and cultural sites were flooded. Environmentally, 
we can talk about um, these organisms that contributed to the extinction of the already endangered Yangtze River dolphin and the Chinese paddlefish, which was one of the largest freshwater fish. The Yangtze River dolphin is the first marine mammal that we have pushed to extinction, and this happened, it was determined to be extinct in the late 90s, I believe. I can't remember for certain. But this is in y'all's lifetime, the it was maybe the early 2000s. Yeah, the Yangtze River dolphin has not been extinct that terribly long. Many other species of plants and animals were negatively impacted by the dam. Yeah, I think this was in the 2000s. I'll have to look that up. The turbines are huge, you can see, and the animals that get passed through them while that's spinning, um, many of them are killed. Landslides are increased along the reservoir. The pressure of the water being there, the changes in the hydrology caused a lot of landslides. Sediment that used to flow down the river is now trapped above the dam, which can cause soil issues in places. So you can see hydropower has a lot of positives and negatives, and it pretty much depends on where it's being put. A lot of dams in the United States are actually being taken down because people have decided the environmental impacts are worse than the energy that we get from them. Tidal power is very similar to dams, but a little bit different. It's created from tidal energy. So the tidal energy spins the turbines. Disadvantages, there's not many suitable sites and the correct construction costs are pretty high. So we can get this out of the way. There we go. So here's basically how it works. It's going to have to be in an area where there's high tides. In the Gulf Coast, you couldn't do this because the tide only changes. It's less than a foot every time the tide goes changes. But up north, different places, and we've talked about this a little bit, the, it's complicated on which areas have high tides and which ones don't. But there's some areas that have really large tides, and basically you have kind of a dam. When the tide comes in, the water goes through the turbine, generates electricity, and fills in this side. Then when the tide goes out, it drains out and produces electricity going the other way. So your dams don't have to be nearly as large, so there's going to be much less um, habitat destruction from this. Geothermal power. This is using the heat from the earth, heat contained in underground rocks and fluid that can be tapped for energy. And again, like a lot of the other power sources we've talked about, you're extracting steam or hot water. It can be used to heat space or water. Um, houses can be heated this way, or you can use the steam to turn a turbine. Depending on how you use it, it's potentially renewable. Um, if it's you're talking about water, you can take too much of the water out of the ground, the hot water. And um, depending on how hot it is, if you do too much, you can actually cool the rocks to where it's not helping you. 22 countries use geothermal. Supplies 1% of the world energy. In the U.S., our geothermal activities, electricity is produced mostly in Hawaii, California, California, Nevada, and Utah. It's not something that's available just everywhere. Advantages. It's reliable, renewable, you get moderate energy yield, 96% less CO2 is emitted, competitive cost, Disadvantages, scarcity of reservoirs. There's not that many places where um, this heat is close enough to the surface for us to use it. When they build plants, sometimes there's deforestation. If you're pumping water out of the ground, it can cause the ground to sink. Noise and odor, a lot of these geothermal areas are, have a sulfurous smell, and if you're pumping water out of the ground, hot water out of the ground, you're releasing that odor. Here's an example of a plant. Okay, and hydrogen fuel cells. You don't hear a lot about this, but this could be a big game changer. Basically, you take hydrogen and you combine it with oxygen to produce electricity. 
One way you can combine hydrogen and oxygen is to actually burn it, but in this case, you're doing it slower and you're producing electricity. The only waste product is water. So imagine a car that the exhaust from the car was not carbon dioxide, not carbon monoxide, any of that smelly stuff from the exhaust fumes. It's water vapor. That's all that comes out of the car. Problems with it, you have to collect the hydrogen. You have to produce and collect hydrogen. And hydrogen is not found naturally on the planet. So to get it, we use electrolysis. Basically, you pass electricity through water, and it breaks it down into hydrogen and oxygen. But you notice it takes electricity to do this. It's easier to, on the one hand, you're using electricity, so that's producing more um, pollution than you were before. But on the other hand, it's a lot easier to make one big power plant energy efficient than it is to make thousands of cars efficient. So, and if you're using green energy, hydroelectric, solar power, things like that, then you don't have a problem. But it is going to increase the amount of electricity we're using if we were to do this. There's currently no infrastructure for this. Um, right now, and this is something that we would have to change up a lot, you can go to a gas station and you can get gas. It's no big problem. If you have a hydrogen fuel cell car, it's hard to find a place where you can get hydrogen to fill up your tank. Most of the local gas stations can't do that. And people are scared of hydrogen. The people have the idea that the hydrogen that hydrogen explodes because of things like this. The Hindenburg was a hydrogen blimp or dirigible. A spark set it off and burned it up. Hydrogen is very explosive, but so is gasoline. People forget that. And we've managed to work with gasoline, and not very many people are killed by gasoline explosions. Some, but not very many. We can do the same thing with hydrogen. Okay, in addition to making the energy in a more um, clean way, another thing we can do is energy con versus conservation. Basically, don't use as much energy. And we've gotten pretty good at this. We've improved on a lot of things. One thing just moder average people can do is moderate the indoor temperature. D deal with your house being a little colder in the winter. Wear a sweater if you have to. Make it a little warmer in the summer. Wear shorts, short sleeve shirts. Conserve water. It takes energy to collect and clean water, especially in places like this. So the less water you use, the less energy you're using. Use energy efficient appliances. If you go to buy a TV or a dishwasher, washing machine, one of the things you can compare, they all have these little guides and they tell you how much energy they use on average in a year. Energy efficient lighting. The old light bulbs that we used to use are pretty much gone. Now we have LEDs and halogen light bulbs and compact fluorescent light bulbs. Compact fluorescents have their own issues because there's mercury vapor in there. Mercury is bad for the environment. But um, they do use a lot less electricity. The LEDs use a whole lot less electricity. Energy conservation through transportation. Use public transportation when possible. That's not a huge issue around here. We don't have a ton of public transportation. But you think about... Um, if a whole bunch of people ride the school bus to school instead of driving their own cars, it's a whole lot less fuel being used. Use cars that have good fuel economy. If you're buying a car, look into that. There's a lot of cars now that get a much better gas mileage than the, any cars have in the past. Look into battery electric and hybrid vehicles. Electric vehicles um, are not they're using electricity. Again, you're still producing fossil fuels if you're depending on where your electricity is coming from. But um, again, it's easier to have the power plant be clean than the thousands of cars. Hybrid vehicles that use gasoline and electricity, things like that. Green building design. This is a thing that has um, gotten pretty popular. There's, there's a whole buildings that are, as they're designed, they're built specifically to reduce energy. Let more light in through the windows so you don't have to use as much artificial lighting. They use passive heating, collect solar energy to produce electricity. 
all kinds of things that buildings can do to reduce their carbon footprint, the amount of electricity that they're using. Okay, so that's the end of uh, renewable resources. And we only have one more unit to go before we've covered everything that's going to be on the AP exam, and that is air pollution. So we'll get to work on that next. Thank you. Have a good day and stay safe.